The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily the views of ECTV News, the City of East Chicago, nor this broadcast station or website. ECTV airs public meetings as a service to the community it serves. Speakers at public meetings, broadcast, or posted by ECTV News are solely responsible for their comments. ECTV News reserves the right to edit or remove any profanity or abusive language or behavior deemed inappropriate for our viewing audience. If you have any comments or suggestions about this program, contact ECTV News at 219-391-8206. Attendance, please. Donato? Present. Francis? Present. Battle? Vasquez? <coughs> Garcia? Present. Orange? Present. Medina? Present. Present. Before we get started, I'd just like to you turn all your cell phones on vibrate. against what is said will result in your immediate removal from these proceedings. Mr. Barr. May it please the Council, Attorney Stephen Bauer. We are here today uh, at a special Council meeting uh, in order to consider a petition that's been filed for the removal of Robert Battle as Councilman for District 3. This is a result of a change in Indiana law of about four years ago in which it authorized the legislative body of class two cities uh, to remove an elected council person if the council by a two-thirds vote determines that the individual is unable to perform the duties of his office. The law at that time also required consuls uh, or the legislative body, which is the common council in, the seven, uh, in a second uh, degree city, uh, to establish a procedure for this. Approximately uh, four or five months ago, uh, you in fact adopted a, an, an ordinance setting forth the procedure which requires a written notice uh, to be sent to the council person identifying or uh, outlining the facts uh, uh, to support uh, a claim that the individual was unable to perform the duties of his office. That has been done. Uh, Councilman Battle has filed a written response basically denying the grounds. The petition that was filed. Uh, makes a specific reference to the fact that he has been incarcerated uh, and held without bail uh, uh, since mid-October of last year. Uh, and um, so where we are uh, today uh, is that the council has also appointed an independent council to present evidence to support the removal. Uh, Robert Battle is entitled to respond and present his own evidence. Earlier, before we began, uh, uh, Robert's sister, uh, 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 Kim Macy, approached me and indicated that she was here today to, to represent her brother uh, in this matter. So. Uh, the players and the procedure we're going to follow uh, is, is for uh, independent consuls been appointed by the consul, uh, Joe Kirsch, uh, to present 
evidence to support a conclusion uh, for the removal. Uh, Kim Macy, uh, Robert's sister, will be permitted to uh, present response evidence. Uh, they can then advance and make argument. Uh, and at that time, uh, during the public meeting, uh, then the council needs to either discuss the matter or make a motion for removal or make a motion for non-removal, at which time a vote is taken. Uh, Robert Battle cannot be removed unless there are six votes for removal. The statute specifically requires a two-thirds vote. Um, uh, given, uh, uh, given that, uh, you are only seven here now. Uh, it is going to take six votes, and once, once the voting is done, if in fact there are six votes for removal, uh, it is also necessary for within five days for the council to file findings of fact and conclusions with the clerk. Uh, my role in this matter will be to listen to the evidence, keep track of what the evidence is, and if there is uh, a, a, a vote for removal to assist in the preparation of findings of fact for the person to decide on the final President Parks, Morning. Council Members. So my name is Joe Kurash. I'll be representing uh, Council submitting evidence to you this morning. Uh, I'd like briefly to begin with uh, an opening statement, if the Council would uh, allow me to do so. Uh, we're here today uh, on the petition for removal of Mr. Battle, Council Member of East Chicago, Common Council, District 3. Battle was re-elected in 2015 and began his second term this year in 2016. As the council is well aware, it is comprised of nine elected members, one representative from each of the six districts, as well as three at-large councilmen. As the legislative body, the city council is responsible for passing ordinances, resolutions, orders, and motions for the city's government. Along with these responsibilities, the council is in control of the city's property, finances, appropriation of all money spent on behalf of the taxpayers. Council members, as elected officials, are entrusted with this duty to provide the ways and means to ensure the safety and security of the citizens of East Chicago and to work to maintain and enhance the quality of life. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, I believe that uh, the evidence that will be presented today will show that Mr. Battle uh, has been indicted, that he has been in custody since October, that he has remained in custody uh, since that date. He is in custody today, and he will remain in custody until the resolution of his federal matter. Currently, that is set for trial in August. I believe that further the evidence will show that based upon Mr. Battle's incarceration at this time, that he is unable to perform his duties as a council member on the East Chicago Common Council. He will be unable to perform those duties uh, for the reasons uh, that he's not present at the meetings, he's not able to vote at the meetings because his presence is not, uh, he, because he will not be present. Uh, he is unable to have constant contact and regular contact with the members of his district. And for those reasons, I believe, and others, that the council, that attorney for the council will show that Mr. Battle is unable to perform his duties and that his removal is necessary. Thank you. Ms. Maxwell, would you like to give an opening statement? Good morning. For the record, my name is Kimberly Maxey, M-A-X-E-Y, and I am here today to represent uh, Councilman Battle in this issue. Um, there have been several correspondents that have went out to the council and have been ignored by the councilman. He has tried to reach out to resolve this issue and there was no response. Now, yes, he has been incarcerated. However, we have an ordinance and we also have policies and procedures that are not being followed. We have a policy and procedures that says, yes, you are unable to perform duties, but it does not explicitly state what the duties are. When Councilman Battle requested what those duties were, his answer was, they are unclear at this time. At this moment, he still has not received a response as far as what specifically the duties are of the council. One of the reasons that was given was he needed to be here to vote and he needed to be present at the meetings. Well, there is no specific attendance policy also of the council that he has requested as well. How many meetings can you miss? Because we understand that there has been an issue with attendance, but there has not been a problem until now. Robert Battle has been in contact with his constituents of the 3rd District. He has provided a letter throughout the 3rd District that let them know his email and how to contact him. He has received several emails. He has received several voicemails in which he has responded to and he plans to keep on responding to them as long as he is the councilman of the third district. Thank you. Courage. from October 12th through uh, April the 25th. Exhibit 2, the Mr. Battle's oath of office uh, for his new, his latest term. Exhibit 3, Information and probable cause affidavit stemming from the charge of murder out of Lake County, Indiana. Exhibit 4, state's motion to dismiss the murder charge in Lake County for the reason that the defendant was indicted by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Indiana for the same circumstances. Exhibit 5, criminal complaint. 
complaint filed in the United States District Court by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District in Indiana. Exhibit 6, the superseding indictment in the United States District Court, Northern District of Indiana. Exhibit 7, the certified records of Mr. Battle's booking into the Lake County Jail. Exhibit 8, the records uh, from the Porter County Jail uh, from the booking as well as the information stating that he has been in custody in the Porter County Jail from November until present. Finally, Exhibit 9, the order of detention uh, in the United States District Court, Northern District of Indiana, in the case in which Mr. Battle has been indicted with possession of marijuana with intent to deliver, conspiracy to distribute cocaine, possession of cocaine with intent to deliver, possession of firearm during a drug trafficking offense causing death. I would move to have those exhibits admitted as evidence at this time. No problem. Also, Clerk Santos, let the record reflect that Councilman Medina is now here. This time, President Parks, I request uh, witness of Mr. James Ventura, if he could be sworn to testify. Mr. Ventura to stand at the podium, at the to podium, sit down yes. at the podium. Okay. Mr. Ventura, would you please state and spell your name? Uh, James Ventura, J-A-M-E-S-V-E-N-T-U-R-A. -E Mr. Ventura, where do you currently reside? I reside at 4935 Graselli Avenue, East Chicago, Indiana. Which district is that in? And that is the 3rd District. Living in the 3rd District, your councilman would be Mr. Battle, is that correct? Uh, correct. Mr. Ventura, there's some questions I'd like to ask you regarding uh, your history. You were a former councilman, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Which district did you represent? I represented the 3rd District. Mr. Ventura, would you describe duties that you had as a councilman uh -huh. for purposes of uh, evidence today? Uh, yes. Uh, as a third as a councilman, um, I had the duty of uh, staying in contact with my constituents. Uh, there were times I, you know, go home and there would be people sitting on my porch. By the time I got home, there'd be guys, people there trying to get a hold of me. Uh, also, um, uh, visible, uh, being able to to, to go around the neighborhood and to see if there's any problems. Um, once in a while myself, this is just me, I used to throw meetings, uh, uh, several meetings, you know, a year, or I would do them uh, every other month, that type of thing. Uh, also, uh, you have to vote on ordinances, resolutions, uh, set on committees. Mr. Ventura, there's a lot of, first of all, there's a lot of work Correct. Uh, certainly need to have a lot of contact with the residents in your district. Is that right? Uh, yes, correct. Uh, and that would be in-person contacts as well as uh, phone calls and such. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, both. Uh, also, not just having that contact, uh, it's the availability. Uh, knowing that uh, if a member in the district has a problem or an issue that needs to be addressed, that you're available to certainly were based on your testimony just now that uh, people would be waiting for you when you arrived home. Is that fair to say? Yes, yeah, there would be sitting on my porch sometimes. Uh, additionally, uh, being present in your district, uh, you're able to eyeball uh, certain issues that are uh, relevant to that district. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Uh, could you briefly describe what some issues uh, 
that would require your personal attention in your district? Okay, well, well, some of the issues were, for example, we have complaints about alleys of being dirty or uh, weeds or lights being out in the neighborhood. Uh, uh, you get calls sometimes, a nuisance calls, uh, safety, suspicious people walking around. Uh, in the winter time, we got a lot of calls for snow removal, uh, parking, sometimes you have to get a resident parking for handicap uh, and so forth. Additionally, you had uh, mentioned something about community meetings. Yes. Could you describe uh, these meetings that you put out? Well, what I would do was I would, um, uh, it was sometimes monthly, sometimes uh, quarterly, uh, depending on what was going on. Uh, I would just uh, go around, you know, pass, flyer, all the houses and um, I would get the local uh, community center and then I would advertise uh, probably a couple of days before that there was going to be a community meeting and I would uh, itemize the issues that we were going to talk. Uh, sometimes I would have the police department there, the fire department. Uh, sometimes department heads from the city would be there to be able to answer questions whether it's housing or buildings or curbs and, and so forth. And the residents would turn out for these meetings? Uh, yes. These meetings, uh, were they able to get things done that the residents wanted? Yes, uh, we would do, we would discuss, uh, you know, we would write them down, I'd write them down, and then what I would do was at the next meeting, or even, let's say within the next couple of weeks, I would get back with the residents and try to get them resolved, and definitely I would try to get them resolved by the next meeting. Yes, correct. Yeah, like for example, the senior citizen a building, uh, you know, we would um, have uh, either hams for Thanksgiving or or uh, uh, we would have uh, roses for the ladies, for the seniors, uh, bingos, we would donate to the bingos, um, uh, sponsor a couple of trips to the zoo and things like that, uh, or shopping to the mall. Uh, additionally, uh Mm -hmm. Could you go into a little detail about that? Well, the president of the council, what he does is he'll he'll assign us to different committees, uh, and so uh, I was assigned to the environmental committee. There's also a tax abatement committee. There's a finance committee. Uh, also, the council uh, has the ability to appoint different members of different people to different commissions. Being on the council, uh, there are council meetings. Correct. And they, how often are they? They're uh, twice a month. Those are the normal meetings, unless there's a special meeting called by the president. So there could be more than two meetings per month. Correct. There's a minimum of two meetings a month, and those are the regular second and fourth uh, Mondays of every month. And is attendance important at these meetings? Uh, well, you have to vote. You have to vote on the ordinances. You have to vote on the budget that will be coming up soon. Uh, budget's very important. It fix the city, fix the workers. Uh, sometimes you have to uh, vote on uh, even, uh, you know, different types of ordinances so, or sponsor things. Sometimes you have to sponsor them. Yeah, you have to sponsor ordinances or resolutions. And these mm -hmm. uh, ordinances and resolutions that you would sponsor, uh, mm -hmm. these, could these directly affect your district? Sure. Yeah, I have sponsored uh, some, you know, and co-sponsored with some of my uh, colleagues. Uh, yeah, it, affected, uh, it affects the city or affects the district. And, you know, whoever sponsors a resolution or the ordinance, it affects the entire city because sometimes another councilman will do it, it will be one at large, and we have to vote on it, support it, or be against it. So it affects the whole city. You had mentioned the budget being very important. Um, I know it seems like a simple question, but uh, mm -hmm. for purposes of this hearing, could you explain why the budget is very well, important to pass? Well, the budget is important because the budget is what... Uh, runs the city, you know, that's what the city goes on for the following year. Uh, it affects all the departments, uh, whether we're going to increase or decrease the budget, we look up, we take a close look at it at all the departments. We have uh, finance committee meetings, 
department head meetings, uh, again, you know, it has to deal with the taxes and tax warrants, and uh, uh, it's very important to running the city. You also mentioned uh, regarding the attendance at uh, meetings, that it's important mm -hmm. for the attendance so that the councilman can vote. Uh, there is no way a councilman or council member who is not present can send a proxy, is there? Uh, not that I know of. I Salaries? Yeah, part of the uh, budget, and we have a salary ordinance that the council has to approve. <coughs> what about zoning? Does the council uh, have any role in zoning issues? In yeah, yes, yes. When, uh, when the zoning procedure goes to the zoning board, then it goes to the plan commission, then it goes to the council for final approval. So the council either accepts it or rejects it or puts conditions on the special use variants or uh, whatever type of other zoning that uh, we may need to pass or reject. Uh, Mr. Venture, you're familiar with Mr. Battle? Uh, yes, I am. Photograph in Exhibit 8, in the Council's Exhibit 8. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize the individual in that photograph? Uh, yes. And is that uh, Councilman uh, Battle? Yes, correct. some calls about problems uh, existing. Yeah, I have calls. I've got some calls about issues. Citizens uh, are contacting you. They don't, they don't know who to contact. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on, but uh, I, you know, there, some of them have called me. Maxson, you have questions for this witness. Just right next, you can question right there. Okay. Just a quick question. If Robert Battle did have representation, where would he or she sit? Just because of the way that we're set up in here, it would be it would be the same place. Um, I understand that um, representatives or the constituents of the third district have been contacting you. And what are you stating? Are you giving them a name to contact, or because we do know that there's three councilmen at larges that should represent the third district in this case, as Mr. Bauer stated that the third district would not be unrepresented. And if they're contacting you. It's apparent that the third district doesn't or appears not to have representation. Are you referring them to one of the three councilmen at largest? Uh, I have uh, actually called the departments in the city myself. Okay. And Do you just, know who to contact? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So in you, the city, yeah. I've been in the city for 35 years. I've worked in the city for 27 years. I. You know, like I said, been a councilman, been a committee man for 27 years, yeah. Right, I'm familiar with you. Yeah. As long as you've been a councilman, have you had an attendance policy or know of the council to have an attendance policy? Uh, I, I mean, I never had a 
I was always here at the council meeting, so I don't know. Was I, some of your constituents not here, and it kind of bothered you? I, I don't know. I it never questioned or never asked. I just came for the meeting. So. Right. It, it didn't bother you, right? I never thought about it. Really. Right. Right. I believe you brought it up. Thank you. Um, so it didn't bother you one way or another if a council member or not was available. I never thought about it. Right, because it takes a majority to pass a vote, not just one individual. Right, it takes the majority to pass a vote. So if the majority is here and one individual not, then if that vote fails, it doesn't depend on that one individual that's not here. Is that correct? Um, I, I understand. Mean, I mean, <coughs> just, uh, yeah, it, 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 you really just kind of, yeah, your vote yeah. is your vote, exactly. Yeah. So you being a representative of the 3rd District, have you had any concerns or have you tried to contact Mr. Battle by cell phone or no, by I, the email? No, I never did. I, honestly, I, I had no idea how to get hold of him. I didn't. Okay. So personally. Have you ever had any trouble with Councilman Battle in his term of being a councilman? Uh, me personally, no. I never got into any problems with Mr. Battle myself personally. Okay, represented pretty well. I mean, 380 people came out to vote for him. So, in being incarcerated, so that kind of sends a message that pretty cool guy will will go ahead and. No more questions. Mr. Curris, redirect. Thank you. Mr. Fails. There's nine council members. It's not going to be bad. It's either going to be passed yes. or be rejected. Exactly. I'm going to object for the same reason. The ability to vote as a council member then becomes more important as the issues that touch on the city. Yes, correct. I don't have anything further. Mr. Ventura, you can step down. Step down. Thanks. Maxson. All right, Mr. Courage handed over a stack of documents, a stack of allegations, I should say, and thank you, I received those already. Um, but Mr. Ventura also stated how the councilman is responsible, responsible for different things, and I'm glad you outlined that because it's not outlined in the policies and procedures. However, um, Mr. Bottle has been in contact as far as donations. Uh, he throws a dinner every year at the Nicosia. No, I'm kind of doing the same thing that you did in the beginning, before you introduced your witness. So, yeah, this is an opening statement before you introduced your 
you had a host of things to say. As opposed to what you do back and forth, Mr. Barr, can you make a ruling on the uh, objection? It is not. He stated different things about what the council members does, and I have not gotten a chance to state. Are we not at that part yet? Okay, well, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. Um, it was stated that um, a, one of the duties of the councilman is to donate, volunteer, however you have. Uh, Mr. Battle has um, thrown a event at the Nicosia building every year or the, for the past two years this year he tried to do the same however I because of the incident I'm sure um, that was denied he did send over thank you cards and happy um, happy Thanksgiving cards for each and every representative at the Nicosia building in which they have contacted him thus far indicating how come or what can we do about the mold in the building, about different things that's going on in the building. So he's well aware of what's going on in the district. Um, again, um, it was stated by Mr. Bauer that the third district does have, will we'll not go unrepresented. And if we're here today, it's because it appears that the third district is unrepresented. So he has been in contact with those. Um, that center. He has um, donated candy for the safe trick-or-treat for the kids on Halloween. So he has done some donations as well. So he has volunteers. He has a precinct committee person. So different things other than being at the council meeting for allegations I point out. We can't claim them as facts for allegations. So we're going to call them what they are. Um, other than that, all of the other duties that he's always done he is still doing those today. Thank you. Ms. Maxey, do you have any, you can step up. This, during this portion, you are allowed to call any witnesses that you may have. If you don't have any witnesses, you can rest also. Um, am I allowed to, um, I, I wasn't um, aware of how to call witnesses. Can I ask questions of a person or? You can ask questions of anyone except for a council member. Okay. And you must bring them up. <coughs> can I address Mr. Bauer? Mr. Bauer is a council attorney, so he's off limits also. <coughs> okay. Uh, is he also Councilman Battle's attorney? In council matters, yes. Okay. Uh, because he has been unrepresented in those matters, so I'm uncertain as if he also represented Councilman Battle as well. Councilman Battle, in what aspect? Uh, as far as the questions he's asked pertaining to uh, council questions, he was um, referred to his own private attorney. So I'm, I'm unaware that if he's also the council attorney and Robert Ballard is a duly official councilman, why wouldn't he answer the questions? That depends on what the question were. I mean, if you can give me an example of a question that would be an answer for you. Okay, the question that was asked as far as the ordinance 16 triple one, um, it states that 15 days from the time that he was served or the policy or the notices was filed, and then 20 days from the notices being filed in the clerk's office, a special meeting should be called. The question was if it states 20 days from the time that the notices are filed and you all filed the notice it does not say the response so the clarification that he stated was it is the interpretation of the council that we're going to interpret it as the response but that's clearly not what it says okay. so we need some clarity as to as to that are you saying that the meeting was not had within 15 days of the the meeting was not scheduled 20 days from the time you all filed it in the clerk's office. Okay. 
and our interpretation was that the meeting was held 20 should be held or actually should be called 20 days after the response after the response right. but it clearly does not say that it is specific that it's 20 days after the notice is filed in the clerk's office does anyone have a copy of that Can we see that for a response, Mr. Bob? Uh -huh. uh, Attorney Stephen Bauer, the way the ordinance was drafted, it, it, it provided for a notice to be sent to a councilman who is alleged to be unable to perform his or her duties. They had 15 days to respond. There is no, it's illogical to expect a meeting to be scheduled for removal until there has been a denial, until a response has been made to the removal petition. So the, the ordinance, the way drafted, the way interpreted was once there was a negative response, then there was 20 days within which for the council to set a special meeting for this hearing. And that was done. This was, in fact, communicated via email to Robert Bauer. His interpretation was that when the petition was filed, you had 20 days to set the hearing. Well, there was no reason to set a special counsel hearing if he filed a response admitting that he's unable to perform his duties. Until he filed a response denying it, there was no reason to set a special meeting. So that's where we are. So I, I see no problem with the procedure you followed. They've had adequate opportunity to, to respond, and, and uh, here you are. Thank you. The issue is that's not what it states. I understand what the interpretation is. So if there's 15 days from the time that it was filed, he has 15. That means you have five to schedule a meeting. That's what the notice states. There is no way that one could interpret anything different unless they wrote it. He didn't write it. He's simply following exactly what the notice says. So it's really unfair and a direct violation to state this is how we're going to interpret something when it's read clearly, when it's written clearly and read that way. Continue if you have one. Oh, okay, and, if, and maybe as it comes to um, Mr. Bauer as well, um, his questions when he uh, contacted um, Attorney Bauer um, on the phone and he um, delivered a message. Um, it's imperative if he's going to speak with his attorney that the message that is delivered back to the council be true. What he stated. Obviously, Robert was calling from jail. I'm not sure how obvious that can be when Mr. Bauer did not hear a pre-recorded message during that phone call. So it's obvious that Mr. Bauer cannot call directly through to your phone and get to you without a pre-recorded message. Mr. Bauer, uh, Robert Bauer asked two questions. What is unable to perform duties? And what is the attendance policy of the council? There was two phone calls that were placed when Mr. Bowers rambled on about how he was a defense attorney. And we're not here to argue that. That's for a different court at a different time. But he did not state to you all that he asked specifically what was the attendance policy. What he stated was there would be a problem with one member of the attendance, and that never was you. So after getting the attendance policy and looking up, that's where it comes that the council has had some issue with attendance, and we won't say members, with some council members. There has been an issue. My point is, why is there a problem now? So if, if council members were not coming, now there's a council member that cannot come for allegations again. Why is there a problem now? Thank you. Okay. 
So it's just my answer does not have any witnesses. She was arrested also. I think we'll move into closing. Unless you have something else, Mr. Kirch. I do. But if uh, this mask, this mask, Maxine, 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 had testified, I do have some questions for her. If I may cross examine the witness. Maxine, you stated that, uh, are you related to Mr. Bell? I am. And uh, how are you related? I'm his sister. Do you recognize this individual? I'm handing you a photograph that's attached to uh, Exhibit 8. I do. Is that your brother, Mr. Battle? That's Mr. Battle. Councilman Battle. <clears throat> Correctly. Fair to say. Fair to wow. say. Fair to uh, say. He served four year term. Successfully. And he was re elected uh, this past November. While incarcerated. And he is currently the third district council. Currently he right. is duly, duly sworn in. Is that correct? That is correct. I am. You will remain in custody of the Porter County Sheriff up until the conclusion of his federal case. Is that right? Fair to say. He's been denied bail at this time. Is that correct? That is correct. He is unable to leave the jail on his own volition since there is no bail set. Yes. When is the trial currently set? August. Possibly, I'm not sure. Was the original setting in January of this year? The original setting was in January. You testified <clears throat> regarding some issues with the, uh, the kosher building that Mr. Battle was aware of? Yes. I'm sure he is. Which ones, which ones are, uh, are this, which issues uh, is Mr. Battle aware of? You can send him a letter and ask him. I'm not sure. Not of all of them, no. Do you have personal knowledge of any other issue other than the bold issue in the negotiable? Absolutely. Our district, uh, can you make area, run down, buildings not being brought up, uh, you have, um, other people is stating different things in the third district, which, again, if you're leaning towards him being not present, there's three councilmen at largest, three councilmen at large that's supposed to represent the third district. So if we're talking about our representation of the third district, we supposed to have representation. It's my belief that uh, councilman or attorney Bauer stated that it was their duty to represent. My belief doesn't matter. I don't live here. I don't live here. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. I am refusing to answer that question, yes. I've been in the third district for half of my life, though. So... Not at this time. Are you a resident of the city of East Chicago? I am not. Not at this time. Regarding uh, Mr. Battle's community outreach, uh, you said that he donated some candy at Halloween. Mm -hmm. uh, 
That's right. I uh, donated water for the water drive. Uh, when was that? Can't say for certain. Flint water crisis. Um, February. Various other things. I can't state everything that he's done. He has different volunteers. I've given him quite a few examples. I don't think that's enough. I've given you the ones that I know of specifically. Specifically, yes. I'm not aware of any other stuff. Step down, Ms. Max. Thank you. At this point, since we have no further witnesses, we'll go with Mr. Kiros's closing argument, and then Ms. Max, you will have your opportunity also. some testimony today uh, as well as uh, there were several documents tendered uh, that I would ask you to consider as evidence. I'm going to go through what is contained in those documents that I'd like you to consider. First, uh, Exhibit 1 that was submitted is the minutes dating from October the 12th of 2015 up until April the 25th of 2016. In those minutes reflects all of the issues that the council voted on, reflects all of the uh, ordinances that the council voted on, reflects the issues that the council heard, <coughs> it reflects the fact that Mr. Battle was not at any of those meetings, nor did he vote at any of those meetings. In addition, the minutes do reflect also the public expression at the end of some of the council meetings, specifically in February, there were some issues brought up by third district citizens about the representative and that they had issues with him and that weren't being addressed. I ask you to consider what's in those minutes as evidence as to Mr. Battle's non voting and non presence from October. Now, as Maxie has discussed attendance or an attendance policy, uh, the issue here is less of an attendance issue and more of the inability to vote and not just up until today's date, but the fact that Mr. Battle will be unable to vote continuing. Currently, uh, this matter is set for trial in federal court in Northern District of Indiana in August. That may get continued again. If it does, Mr. Battle, if not removed, would continue to serve as councilman, unable to attend meetings, unable to vote on any issues until that trial date. The attendance issue, as Ms. Maxey was approaching it, there's no end in sight for this lack of attendance and inability to vote. There is no end in sight. Upon the completion of that trial, Mr. Battle will either be convicted or he'll be found not guilty. What I submit to you is that he's charged in the Northern District of Indiana. 
the odds are he's going to be convicted. He is not going to be returning to the 3rd District anytime soon. I ask you to consider that. Mr. Battle took an oath of office, as all of you did. And in that oath, it is, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Indiana, and that I will faithfully, impartially, and diligently discharge the duties of the office of the City Common Council Member, East Chicago District 3, according to the law and the best of my ability. Signed by Robert Battle. And this is his most recent oath of office uh, filed this year, Exhibit Number 2. Mr. Battle took the oath of office to discharge his duties. Those duties may not be outlined specifically by state statute or by ordinance. However, this council can certainly consider the ordinances that have been passed by the City of East Chicago, as well as the Indiana Code, the statutes that have been passed by the Indiana Legislature. One of the things that has been passed by the East Chicago Common Council and as an ordinance is attendance at meetings. And it says members shall be required to attend meetings of the Common Council. And that's uh, East Chicago City Ordinance is 30.03. Doesn't say may attend meetings, doesn't say can attend meetings, it's shall. Common Council members shall. There's no room for when it's convenient or when it isn't convenient for a council member not to be present. Now, obviously, as with any job, issues do come up, people do miss work, people can miss a council meeting. Certainly, that is understandable. But when, in Mr. Battle's case, he has not appeared since October, he will not appear at the next meeting or the meeting after that or for several more meetings, and I submit to you that he's never going to appear again in front of the city council, attendance is not the issue becomes his ability to represent and carry out his oath of office, represent the 3rd District. You heard from Mr. Ventura, he's a former councilman, uh, and the evidence that he testified to is the necessity of the council members to be in their district. First of all, it is required that one lives in their district. And the reason for that is so that the, the residents have a face. They have a person that they can express their the problems that they have in their district to. And they know that that person will then represent them in the council meetings and with the city so that the issues that they are having in their district and at their home can be resolved. Mr. Battle is in custody. He is incarcerated in the Porter County Jail. He is unable to meet with his constituents. He is unable to meet the residents in the third district. He is unable to walk around the third district. He is unable to drive around the third district. He doesn't know if there's any street lights out. He doesn't know if there's any issues with garbage in the alley. He doesn't know if there's any issues with buildings or specific buildings. He doesn't know if there's buildings that need to be uh, condemned or taken down. He is out of touch with the third district. By being out of touch, he cannot properly represent them and he cannot fulfill his duties as a councilman. Exhibit 3 that I've submitted for your consideration is a probable cause affidavit that was submitted to the court in Lake County under the penalties of perjury and lays out certain facts that support the charge of murder by Mr. Battle. I would ask counsel to consider There 
was a conversation between Mr. Alvarez, the attorney who represented uh, Mr. Battle initially, and officers and agents who were investigating the matter uh, of the death of Raimundo Camarillo in East Chicago. They, they were notified they were notified by Mr. Alvarez that Robert, his client, uh, would like to turn himself in on that charge. He gave a story where Ray and Robert were talking inside the residence located at 4228 Euclid Avenue in East Chicago, Lake County, Indiana, and he indicated the conversation moved outside where Robert and Ray continued that conversation and Ray allegedly pulled out a knife in response uh, to that Robert shot Ray. This conversation continued and there were specific items that the investigators were able to see and hear the way this conversation happened. Uh, Mr. Alvarez spoke with his client in the lobby. Uh, there was a DEA agent present in the lobby and was able to overhear these conversations. Additionally, the other investigators remained in the conference room with the door open. They were able to observe conversation and hear a good portion of the conversation between Mr. Alvarez and Mr. Battle. The dialogue that continued regarding the murder was that the investigators were informed that there was no struggle between Ray and Robert, and they were able to determine that between because of the words that he used in speaking with Mr. Alvarez as well as the gestures he was making. Additionally, it was stated that Robert threw the gun somewhere in the house located at 4228 Euclid, and that Robert was uncertain as to the location of the knife that was possessed by Mr. Camarillo and that it may be in the alley. Investigators, doing their job, went to the scene, they viewed the area, they found no knife, they found no gun. Search warrant was executed, no weapon was recovered at the residence of 4228 Euclid in East Chicago. Additionally, and what I feel is to be very important, is that a search of the 911 records indicate that no calls were received from Mr. Battle or anyone associated with him regarding the incident that occurred with Mr. Camarillo. Now, Exhibit 4 is the motion to dismiss. Certainly do not contend that the Lake County Prosecutor's Office is continuing the prosecution. Uh, the reason for the motion to dismiss is that Mr. Battle was indicted by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Indiana. And this is the same facts and circumstances that the state charged, the federal government has charged. Uh, an individual cannot be convicted or tried for the same matter. That is the reason that the state of Indiana dismissed their case. Exhibit 5 is the criminal complaint filed in the Northern District of Indiana. A few items that I'd like to draw the Council's attention to. The DEA agents, the Lake County Combined Task Force, began an investigation regarding to the drug trafficking activities of Mr. Battle back in April of 2015. During their investigation, they were able to obtain a, a, a GPS uh, or ping uh, ability on Mr. Battle's phone. And what that was is that they are able to track him, essentially. This came to a head on Friday, September the 18th, where they were tracking Mr. Battle as he left his residence and went to Flint, Michigan. They tracked him into, into Flint, Michigan and on his way back to Northwest Indiana. Fortunately, they were not able to stop him because they were unsure of the vehicle that he was driving. They did maintain surveillance at his home 
And as the investigators in the uh, federal case have stated, his Maryville residence. They continued the surveillance at 145 that day in September, and they viewed the Pontiac Grand Am arrive at the rear of the Maryville residence. It's continued to Wednesday, September 23rd, in the morning, they observed Mr. Battle leave the residence and head to Flint, Michigan again. This time they contacted the FBI in Flint, Michigan. They learned where he was at in Michigan at 2715 Winona Street. That address reflected a Mr. Walters. Mr. Walters has been identified by the DEA as a cocaine trafficker operating in the Flint, Michigan area. During this time, the agents were very specific in tracking his return to Indiana. At 11.19, they received a ping which showed that he was traveling down I-69 in Michigan heading toward northwest Indiana. They then established surveillance on the westbound ramp along Interstate 94. A few minutes later, they observed a four-door dark colored Grand Am traveling westbound on that interstate. It was the same Grand Am that they observed outside of his miracle residence, that would be Mr. Battle's miracle residence. They continued observing this vehicle, and eventually a traffic stop was initiated on that vehicle. During the traffic stop, the, the uh, trooper, the United States Police Trooper, identified the driver of the Pontiac Grand Am as Mr. Battle. He detected an odor of raw marijuana in the vehicle, and during the search of the vehicle, officers located 73.22 grams of marijuana in the vehicle. Additionally, during the search, they also discovered a backpack containing $100,000, $100,700 in United States currency, which is wrapped in rubber bands. Based upon the training and experience of the agents involved, this large quantity of money and the manner in which it is wrapped is consistent with drug trafficking. Additionally, the agents in Flint, Michigan, telephonically applied for and received authority for a judge in the Eastern District of Michigan to execute a federal search warrant at the 2750 Winona Street address in Flint, Michigan. DEA agents from the Flint Resident Office executed that search warrant, found nine ounces of cocaine, $7,000 in United States currency, three stolen handguns, and one empty kilogram wrapper. Mr. Walters was subsequently arrested and remains in custody. These are the facts that filed in the Northern District of Indiana. The superseding indictment, Exhibit 6, lays out what Mr. Battle has been indicted with, and it's various drug charges, that he did knowingly and intentionally possess with the intent to distribute 500 grams or more of a mixture of a substance containing a detectable amount of cocaine, that he did knowingly or intentionally possess with the intent to distribute a quantity of a mixture and substance containing a detectable amount of marijuana, and he did knowingly carry, use, and discharge a firearm during and in relation to a drug trafficking crime for which he may be prosecuted in the court in the United States. That is conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute and distribute five kilograms or more of cocaine as set forth in count one of the indictment. Furthermore, during and in relation to the crime of possession with the intent to distribute 500 grams or more of cocaine set forth in count two, that in the course of these violations, the defendant, Mr. Battle, caused the death of Raimundo Camarillo Jr. through the use of a firearm. Such killing being murder is defined in the United States Code and that it was an unlawful, willful, deliberate, and malicious killing committed with malice of forethought. Finally, in Count 5, the defendant, Mr. Battle, while engaged in offense punishable under Section, section Title 21 in the United States Code, as the narcotics conspiracy charge of the superseding indictment, he knowingly and intentionally killed Raimundo Camarillo Jr. This is Exhibit 6. Exhibit 7 is the booking information provided to Lake County. I'd like to draw your attention to one specific section there. That is in the last page of the booking, the second to last page of the booking information. The employer is 
listed as East Chicago. His job description is listed as counsel. Furthermore, information provided by the Porter County Sheriff's Department is that Mr. Battle has been in custody in the Porter County Jail since November the 17th when he was transferred there. He's currently uh, still in their facility. Mr. Battle has been identified in his booking photo. That is, that is him. Additionally, the booking information in Porter County identifiers do match up with that in Lake County, date of birth, Social Security name. Uh, additionally, uh, it also states occupation, city official, employer, city of East Chicago. Mr. Battle has been indicted by the United States uh, District Court in the District of State of Indiana, and Hammond is one and the same. Finally, I'd like you to consider the order of detention that was ordered in the court by Magistrate Paul Cherry regarding the charges that Mr. Battle is facing in the Northern District of Indiana. The magistrate concluded that the facts require the defendant be detained pending trial. Specific facts are listed in the court's order. And those facts are that, one, there is probable cause to believe that the defendant has committed an offense for which the maximum prison term of 10 years or more is prescribed in the Controlled Substances Act. The defendant has not rebutted the presumption established by finding that no condition would reasonably assure the defendant's appearance and the safety of the community. There is a serious risk that the defendant will not appear. There is a serious risk that the defendant will endanger the safety of another person in the community. <coughs> Furthermore, the court made a statement for the reasons of detention. And it's, I find that the testimony and information submitted at the detention hearing establishes by a preponderance of the evidence but there is a serious risk that the defendant will not appear at a future court hearing in this case, and there is no condition or combination of conditions that can be imposed to assure his or her court appearance in this case in the future because, one, of the nature and circumstances of the offense is charged, two, the weight of the evidence against the defendant, three, the defendant frequently ingested an illegal substance to the arrest in, his, in this case. Four, the defendant failed to appear at the two court hearings in the year of 2001. Furthermore, the court went on. I, found, I find that the testimony and information submitted at the detention hearing establishes, by clear and convincing evidence, that to release the defendant on pretrial release will endanger the safety of another person or the safety of the community in general. And there is no condition or conditions that can be imposed to assure the safety of of the other person or the safety of the community in general because of the nature and circumstances of the offenses charged, the weight of the evidence against the defendant, the defendant's frequent daily ingested of an illegal substance until the arrest in this case, that the defendant has a history of criminal activity, he's been arrested six times for past criminal charges, police believe between 2006 and 2015 at various times the defendant sent cocaine to one person in a total amount of approximately 31 kilograms. Preliminary evidence in this case indicates that the defendant shot a man in the back, not at close range. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, the facts of the criminal matter as charged, as indicted in the Northern District of Indiana show that Mr. Battle shot Mr. Camarillo, that this was not at close range, that it does not coincide with Mr. Battle's first assertion that it was in self-defense. No weapon was found on Mr. Camarillo. Uh, I submit to you that this was not in self-defense, that it was, in fact, murder. Furthermore, based on the information that has been provided to you, in these documents, court documents. Mr. Battle is looking at very serious charges. Given the weight of the evidence and the conviction rate in the federal courts, 
submit to you that Mr. Battle will not be returning to his council seat. I believe that there is a very high likelihood of a conviction based on his admissions alone. Even if, even if he was not convicted on all charges, conviction of the drug charges alone would prevent Mr. Battle from returning anytime soon, if ever, to his council seat. Furthermore, that would be a felony conviction, and he would be removed for that reason, but just in his ability to vote and attend meetings, I don't see for the foreseeable future Mr. Battle ever returning to perform his duties. As you're aware, there's been public expression, specifically there was several comments made, well there's been several comments made in the council meetings regarding Mr. Battle. Uh, there were some from February 8th of 2016, uh, and I find it uh, interesting that uh, Ms. Maxey had testified regarding some issues that he's aware of in the Nicosia building, and that the issue, the public uh, expression was from the representative of the Nicosia building regarding Mr. Mr. Battle's representation. I'd ask you to recall, and if you do not, consider the minutes and the expression that was made in those minutes regarding Mr. Battle. Mr. Battle is unable to perform his duties. It's very simple. He is not present. He cannot vote. He is not in touch with the community. There's been some testimony regarding the fact that he's available by email, certainly not available by phone. In order for somebody to speak to him, he would need they would need to be on his jail list. Typically jails don't allow any visitor to come in he needs to be on a list for a period of time, and they only redo those every so many months. There's no furlough or ability for Mr. Battle to visit his district while he's in custody. There's no other way for Mr. Battle to do his job. The residents of East Chicago deserve someone who's going to be present, deserve someone who's going to faithfully execute their duties, who's going to ensure that the issues they have in their district are addressed. There's some testimony by Mr. Ventura about how when he would come home from work there'd be people on his front porch. Now certainly things you can consider are your own personal experiences as a council member, and I'm sure each of you have had those experiences, each of you know how important it is to address the citizens in your district. In order to do that, you must be present. It's just that simple. Furthermore, with nine members on the council, it's designed that way. It's designed that way so that when there's a vote, something doesn't just fail, it's either passed or it's not passed. And if it's not passed, there's a reason for it. As of right now, with an even number, eight members, any resolution that is voted on may not pass just for the reason that the numbers aren't there. There's a reason there's an odd number. There needs to be a tiebreaker. There's no provision to allow somebody else as a tiebreaker since there's nine members. I ask you to consider that as well. Not only is he able to perform his duty, but his inability to do that can prevent you from performing yours. Some other things to consider. The investigators in the criminal matter have identified two residences, one in East Chicago and one in Maryville, Mr. Battles. Now, residency is a requirement in order to be a council member. I submit to you that by maintaining two residences, his intention is to live outside the district. He is not here to address that. There's been no evidence to suggest that he doesn't maintain two residences. The evidence presented has been, I believe, overwhelming in the removal of Mr. Battle. There has been no evidence to contradict anything laid out in any of these court documents. These court documents have been, specifically the probable cause affidavit, sworn to under penalties of perjury, and he's been sworn
submitted as evidence. There is no evidence to contradict this. There is no evidence that has been presented by Mr. Battle to contradict any of these allegations. The defense that Mr. Battle has been using is attendance and that, well, other people have missed meetings. Why can't he? Well, the problem there, ladies and gentlemen, very specifically is, as I've addressed, he's not coming back. If a member misses a meeting, and they're at the next one. There are certain things that can happen where someone may miss a meeting, but they will be back. They are in their community. Mr. Battle is not coming back. Furthermore, the assertion that, well, there's three at-large council members, so they could represent the third district. The three at-large council members are to represent the entire city. They cannot be confined to the third district. The third district has already has a council member. He's just not here. He's not accessible to them. He is not performing his duties. He's not voting. He's not addressing their concerns properly. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the evidence supports the removal of Mr. Battle as council member of the Chicago Common Council. I would ask you that when the time comes to vote, that you vote to remove him based upon the testimony and evidence that has been presented here today. Thank you. Ms. Maxey. Give you all time to wake up here. I was unaware you hired a prosecuting attorney. We kind of went through a trial there. Um, he stated one thing that I agree with. Councilman Battle was at home on that day. There's no such things as facts and allegations. It's either an allegation or it's a fact. Again, he laid out a whole trial of allegations. The law specifically states it calls for a conviction. He has not been convicted of anything. He laid out a whole timeline of different things that he's doing or he has done. As long as Robert Battle has been on this council, has anyone been aware of any of those allegations? Of course not. Because again, they are allegations. Again, he laid out some other things and some other things that I won't even recall because it was just tasteless and it did not have anything to do with this particular session. Now, my um, concern is that if we have representation for all of the council members, why is it that Robert Battle has not received proper representation? It is to my knowledge that Attorney Bauer has counseled everybody on the council except Robert Battle. When he comes with the question, he's referred to get him a lawyer. Now the council hired an additional lawyer in addition to paying uh, Attorney Bauer almost up to $60,000 to counsel the council. So basically everything that Mr. Koresh laid out here has already been laid out for Mr. Bauer, so he could have stated that. So the bogus statement of, I cannot represent the council because I'm also Councilman Battle's attorney, is just that bogus. He has already represented the council and everything else. So it's really unfair that we have the prosecuting attorney over here to lay out different things that should not be laid out here today. Um, also, he has, again sent out letters to the entire district and I'm going to ask how many meetings have been overflowed with third district council I mean with third district representatives calling for a removal of councilman battle if there was a big concern in the third district there will be meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting overflowed this man had 308 people to 
to come out and vote for him. Now, Valid, yes, he did run unopposed. But it says something when you have 308 people to vote for you while you're incarcerated. And it's not like no one knew he was incarcerated. He's been ran on every newspaper and been in every news station. So they knew. So we have adequate time to come up with how can we remove Councilman Battle. Then we have a time where we know he's about to get sworn in. Because he can get sworn in. He knows his right. We get sworn in and it's still not an issue. We've had everybody outside of the 3rd District to come inside of East Chicago's business to call for the removal of Councilman Battle, but no 3rd District. He mentioned one, Mr. Curtis mentioned one resident of the Nicosia building to state something back in February. We are in May. One person. Big deal. Everybody's not going to be happy with them. But it says a lot in this case for the silence. Silence is golden in this case. Everybody understands how political billion work. You come out, you represent him. Next day you might not have a house. Next day your, your mother or whoever else might lose their job. We understand political billion. So Robert is going to encourage his supporters. It's okay. Don't do that. Your silence is golden in this case. Now, you can't remove Councilman Battle. That's perfectly fine. But there is an appeal process, which will happen. Council um, Attorney Bauer stated in the uh, email that he sent to you all that he told Robert Battle he was an embarrassment to the city of East Chicago, which is a lie. He did not state that. He also stated that he has caused and created a firestorm, which is a lie. He did not state that either. So if we're going to have representation across the board except him, it kind of seems unfair that you have two lawyers and you have none. That, that's real unfair. At least the one that he hired or voted for should give him some type of advisement. But he has not received that. He has not received, just to be fair, any support. You sat on the council with him for years. Has he ever given you any trouble, anything to say, oh, this was coming? Hmm. So to just to simply shut one man out over a stockpile of allegations is totally unfair. Again, he has his day in court, just like everybody else. So either we're going to follow the law or we're not. We can't choose to, to, to straddle the fence. On this case, we're going to follow uh, what it says. Okay, well, he doesn't have to have a conviction. He's charged, and we're going to believe everything that's stated. As Mr. Kerr said, he's never coming back. Judge and jury. How do you decide to be judge and jury? That's totally unfair. So I'm not going to keep you as long as he did because you've already heard all of the allegations again. But I am going to state that in this case, if we're going to specifically follow law and procedures, I believe that this is a direct retaliation because we cannot defend what the policies and procedures say. Yes, attendance is a big deal because that's why we're here. He's not here to vote. Okay. But you also have a law or a policy that states that you can have communication via telephone or via video conference. Now, whether you done it or not, that's not the case. It's inside of your policies and procedures. So if he requests that and you don't know how to do it, then we need to understand why is that not being addressed. Because it's not up to, it, it'll be a difference if, he stated, well, I 
me to attend it or I want to come in via telephone or via video conference, you get it set up and he don't show. Now that's that's something different. But understand he has civil rights as well. So again, if he is not convicted as the law states, he's just charged at this moment, we have to abide by the law. So we're gonna do the law or we're gonna ride with what the naysayers are saying and we're gonna have that. But you have to be able to defend what you go by. Thank you. He can address what you said as well as you addressed what he said. That's when the prosecution goes first, he gets a chance to come back. And that's one, um, regarding conviction and allegations, uh, yes, conviction, he'd be gone. Uh, these are allegations, however, there, there's something with the allegations I want you to consider, and one is in a criminal court, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. In this court, it's preponderance of the evidence, much, much lower burden. In regards to uh, comments about Mr. Bauer, I just feel that it's necessary to state that Mr. Bauer does represent the council. Uh, ethically, uh, he cannot represent Mr. Battle in these proceedings. Uh, ethically, he cannot present the evidence to remove Mr. Battle. Uh, that is the reason that independent counsel was hired. I uh, want to address the fairness issue. Uh, certainly, uh, that seems to permeate the arguments made by Mr. Battle's representative. And something that I think is unfair is that the 3rd District is not being represented. Regarding the votes that Mr. Battle received, 308 votes, no way to know if those are straight Democrat votes, if they were voted solely for the reason that, hey, there's nobody else, I'll vote for this guy. Uh, regarding, uh, regarding the evidence, ladies and gentlemen, this is the evidence that's been submitted. This is the evidence. Consider. And I submit to you that there has been no evidence presented to contradict what is in these documents that have been presented to you. That is what I'm asking you to consider. Thank you. Ms. Max, anything further? Council members, any questions? With no questions, based on the evidence that we've heard today, Chair will now accept the motion. So move for removal, Mr. President. Second. Motion made for removal by Councilman Garcia, second by Councilman Franceschi. Any questions on the motion? Clerk Santos, roll call for removal. Maldonado? Yes. Franciski? Yes. Vasquez? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Orange? Yes. Medina? Yes. Monroe? Yes. Parks? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, Mr. President, um, would you like to direct me to formulate the findings of fact and submit them to you for signature based upon what the evidence was here today? Yes, do that and we'll have that on file in the clerk's office once it's submitted to me. If there's no further business, the chair will now accept the motion for adjournment. So move, Mr. President. Second. Motion to adjourn made by Councilman Garcia, second by Councilman Moreau. Any questions on adjournment? Clerk Santos, roll call for adjournment, please. Maldonado? Yes. Franciski? Yes. Vasquez? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Orange? Yes. Medina? Yes. 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 Meeting adjourned.